Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight for another uh, APSA webinar. Tonight's webinar will be on the topic of gap years, post backs, and uh, career changes. Um, I, you know, don't want to uh, delay us anymore, so I think we should just go around and have our panelists introduce themselves. If you can conclude where you're currently training at and what you did during your gap year, just briefly. That would be great. Um, I'll start with, and I'll just call on you by name. So maybe we can start with Brian. Yes, I'm happy to introduce myself. So my name is Brian Thomas. I am currently a, a fifth year MD PhD candidate at the University of Missouri Columbia School of Medicine. And during my gap year, I actually took three wonderful gap years um, working at the University of Washington, um, Washington University in St. Louis, um, doing some basic science research. Thanks, Brian. Deborah. Hi, everybody, and thank you so much for having me. I'm Deborah Rupert. I am in my final year of the MD PhD program at Stony Brook, um, applying to anesthesiology this cycle. And I took a uh, five, I guess, I don't even know if I should call them gap years. Um, and I worked in clinical trials research at Columbia looking at investigational drugs and devices for interventional cardiology trials. And I also um, got two master's degrees, one in neuroscience of nutrition, a uh, personal area of interest of mine, and then the other in biotechnology in part related to the work that I was doing uh, in clinical trials. Great, thanks. Uh, Alan? Hey everyone, my name is Alan. I am a sixth year DO PhD student at Michigan State University. Uh, before beginning my program, I did two gap years with the National Institutes of Health over in Bethesda, Maryland slash Washington DC area. Um, yeah. Great, thanks. Anna. Hi everyone, I'm Anna. Uh, I am a third year MD PhD student at the University of Rochester in upstate New York. Um, I spent uh, between college and then matriculating here, I spent three years living in New York City, um, doing research uh, in a lab first at Rockefeller University and then up at Mount Sinai Hospital um, while I was taking classes uh, in the evenings at uh, Hunter College um, and sort of during that period was was sort of assessing if I what I wanted to do and decided during that period that I wanted to apply to MD PhD program. So it was sort of, uh, you know, completing the prerequisites for that during that time period. Um, it's great to have you all here. Great, thanks. And Haley. Hi. Hey, um, thank, thank you guys for having me here. Um, so currently I'm at the, the Ohio State University. I'm in the MD PhD program. Um, technically I'm in my first year of my PhD, but I had a kind of non-traditional pathway and that I started in the MD only track. And then I took a research year. And then after the research year, I wanted, I asked my mentors to transfer to the MD PhD. So I'm in my second year in my current lab, but first year officially in the program. And I also did a gap year. I also did the uh, NIH uh, post back program in Bethesda. Wonderful. Well, we really appreciate all of you panelists for joining us tonight uh, and sharing your knowledge. I know um, this is one of our more popular kind of webinars and, and folks who can attend live will often uh, rewatch the YouTube recording. So if you are gonna step away, it will be posted to YouTube uh, within a week or so. Um, my name is Eli Wisdom and I'll be your moderator tonight. I'm a third year MD PhD student at Oregon Health and Science University. Um, in the chat box helping us moderate is Min Pham and our volunteer live tweeting the event is Kyle Enriquez. So thanks uh, Kyle and Min. Um, so I'll just remind uh, everybody who's tuning in live, you can submit your questions just in the, use the Q&A function. And um, we'll have our team of, you know, moderators behind the scenes populating um, the list of questions for me on my Google Doc. And I have already kind of a pre-selected um, list of questions from those who submitted them during the registration process. So um, with that, I'll kind of kick it off And this question. I'll probably just direct questions randomly um, to, to certain panelists, but this one I think 
we could go around and have all of you share uh, what your undergraduate background um, was. And I'll start with uh, Brian. Yeah, so I actually, um, I'm a Missouri lifer. So I've, li I've lived in Missouri my entire my entire life. And so I attended the University of Missouri for, for undergrad and I studied biochemistry. Um, and, and with, a, I believe, a, a minor in, in chemistry at the time. Yep. Great. And Deborah, what was your undergraduate background like? Yeah, so I actually attended a small liberal arts school in the uh, middle of nowhere, Minnesota, called Carleton College. Um, and I studied neuroscience there. Great. Haley? I did my undergrad at uh, Indiana University. And I got a bachelor's of science in biology. Um, honestly, I started off with in the biochem because I heard that was like a good major for pre-meds. And uh, over time I switched to biology because it was like honestly an easier major. And I was like, I'm gonna enjoy these years. I know med school's gonna be hard enough. So um, I think it's really true. They say like, it doesn't really matter what your major is in undergrad. And some of my like favorite classes and most exciting classes were like, um, sociology and anthropology and things like that yeah i totally agree um anna uh i did my undergraduate degree at princeton university studying electrical engineering um, with a minor in east asian studies very cool and alan uh, I did my undergrad uh, i got my bachelor's of science at the university of michigan um, in biochemistry I was pre-med and then got involved in research just because I thought I needed research experience to get into med school and then fell in love with research, uh, did my post -bac program at the NIH, and for some reason decided I would do both the uh, medical degree and the PhD. Great. Okay, so everyone's kind of have like a science, like undergraduate background, but it is definitely true that uh, you don't necessarily need to have a, a science undergraduate major to kind of pursue this career. Um, the next question, I'll go back to you, Alan, is how do I know if taking a gap year is right for me? Can you kind of walk us through like what your thought process was instead of applying right out of undergrad, why you chose to do take a gap year? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think um, it's going to be a kind of a cop out answer. I think the reasons for taking a gap year are going to be different for everyone. Uh, for me, it was honestly, indecisiveness. I didn't know if I wanted to pursue medicine or if I wanted to pursue research. Um, so like I said, I went to the NIH, the NIH post back program, and that was a good way for me to continue exploring both. Honestly, I, I got to do research um, and I also got to shadow a lot of really great physicians at the NIH. And that's, again, the reason why I decided to pursue both degrees. Um, so that was, that was my reasoning, uh, just the indecisiveness. But I will say that um, in hindsight, I mean, I didn't realize how burnt out I was at the time. I mean, I'd been in school since elementary school, you know, so uh, just having two years where I could be, yeah, I could go home and not have to think about the exam coming up next week. Um, that was really nice. Um, that was like some of the most freedom I've had ever in my life. And also, you know, returning back to school with having two years of work experience under my belt. Um, I mean, look, get on my application, but also it just meant I was in a lot less financial stress, um, you know, going into my program compared to other people who are having to take out loans for whatever reason. I mean, having worked two years, I don't have to take out any loans really. Um, and other people get to take out far fewer loans for having taken those gap years. So I think there's, um, a lot of reasons for, for people to strongly consider a gap year. That's great. So kind of started off of just like you know, the indecisiveness and then uh, ended up, you know, being a benefit for many other reasons. Any of the other panelists um, have any other specific reasons or, um, you know, why they took gap years or multiple gap years before matriculating? I'm happy to share my experiences. So I was actually forced into a gap year. Um, I um, originally was was an undergrad and decided, hey, I want to do medicine. Um, and, and unfortunately, that first trial at, at applying to to medical schools was unsuccessful for me. Um, and so there's a couple of things that are really gained from this. Um, dealing with adversity, a lot of us are, are so successful in our undergrad careers, our, you know, our high school and undergrad careers that we, you know, we do so well, we're so used to just being successful. Um, so this is the, you know, one of the first times in my life that you, know, you got to deal with a little bit of adversity um, and come back and have to try again. 
And so I was forced into, into um, that gap year. And that's when I went and found a, you know, just a research position. I didn't even, I didn't feel the need to, to go um, get better grades or anything like that. I just wanted to get more experience in, in, in doing something I really, you know, thought I enjoyed and loved. Um, so again, with, with doing that, I took an extra two gap years um, because I just kind of fell in love, um, fell in love with the science. And I realized that um, kind of as Alan had, had hinted at, you get to enjoy life outside of school. You know, you have that nine to five or that nine to six, um, and you can really enjoy turning off at six o'clock, uh, five or six o'clock and enjoying um, time with your family, friends, um, significant other. Um, and so I really, I really kind of fell in love with that. And I was also um, maturing. And I think the gap years are a wonderful time to, to mature as a human. You do, you have bills, you have relationships, um, you have responsibilities and, you know, in your full-time job. And so it gives you a great opportunity to, to mature. And a lot of times, um, you know, as I'm in my PhD and, and I see a lot of these younger students and talk with some of our, our faculty here, and they see a lot of success out of the people who did take a gap year. They see more success out of those people who did take a gap year because of that opportunity to mature. Um, and so, you know, once I, once I, um, you know, I had made the decision to, to reapply and, and, and talk to my, my wife and my fiance at the time uh, and, to, and to let me do so, um, I was, like I said, much more mature in a much better position and kind of reflecting back um, you know, I originally replied just medicine. Um, and so I found kind of a new love during that gap year um, and allowed me to to um, kind of pursue this new this new path. That's really cool. That's great. Um, any other ones, Haley, Deborah, or Anna? Yeah, I, I think I can chime in a little bit here. I, I think my experience was a little bit similar to Alan, but maybe a little bit more extreme in that coming out of college, I... I really like I, I didn't know I, I hadn't really heard about MD PhD programs actually um I think you know when I started college I you know decided I was going to study engineering and I was um doing a lot of like language like, I took I took Chinese and so you know that was like five days a week of classes with like extra exams on Fridays and so it was already my schedule was very full and so at that point in time I had sort of taken I'd taken medicine off of my list of, po of possibilities that I was considering and it wasn't until sort of halfway through college that that I was sort of looking about trying to figure out what I wanted to do after I graduated. And um, for for a variety of reasons, medicine sort of came back on my list at that time, but certainly wasn't really anywhere near the top of my list of considerations. Um, and then it wasn't really until I also like didn't really want to go to graduate school. And it wasn't really until my senior year of college that I really was enjoying some of my more advanced, you know, I was taking some graduate courses, I really found a research project that I was more interested in. Um, and so then kind of started thinking about graduate school at that point in time, and was sort of thinking about these things separately. But either way was going to apply to jobs after I graduated, because I wasn't ready to apply to any, any sort of further education at that point in time. And so for me, it was really about finding a position after I graduated that would allow me the flexibility to continue exploring some of these options that that I was interested in. Um, and, you know, and I also I like wasn't practically ready to apply like I had not taken organic chemistry, I hadn't taken biochem, I hadn't like technically had my biology, like biology one was the very last prerequisite I come or biology two I guess was the very last prerequisite I completed before like in like the fall while applying to to medical school so it, like it sort of got a little turned around um but yeah and and then sort of it was the process once I was sort of working um and then was fortunate to be in an environment where we were collaborating with some MD PhD students and it sort of came onto my radar as like Oh, like this this combined training is is a is sort of a path of its own that sort of is in some ways distinct from either medical school or graduate school. And I think for me, sort of meeting people who were doing that, I felt a real resonance with them in terms of like their values and their interests. And I could sort of see myself in in their shoes in a way that I couldn't really see myself you know, there were things that attracted me about medical school and about graduate school, but there were also other things that I felt didn't quite fit for me um, in those paths. And so, you know, for me, spending that time was really essential to even discovering that, that this was what I wanted to do. Um, so just, you know, for anyone who 
you know, feels like it's either too late or like that they really don't know. Like, I think sometimes coming to these sessions, like there's a lot of lingo that also me, like as a, I wasn't a pre-med and undergrad. And so like, I didn't even know, you know, I didn't really know like anything about what was on the MCAT or like really what I knew the MCAT existed, but, you know, or even this concept of like gap years, like what did that really mean? And what did that mean for me as someone who wasn't even sure I was applying to medical school? Um, so, you know, don't, don't, if that's, if that sounds like you don't get discouraged, um, you know, it's really about exploring um, and, and finding mentors and, and getting experience that can inform for yourself, you know, what is it that you enjoy and what is it that you can see yourself doing in the future? Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, Deborah, you took several years off. Did you, you know, know that you wanted to apply dual degree right after undergrad or what were your, what was your reasoning for um, taking time off? Yeah, I mean, I think everyone has already given just fabulous answers and they all parts of them all resonate a little bit with with my story. But I think it also very much depends on like your your background and where you're coming from. I, I like I said, attended a small liberal arts school. Um, we we certainly did not have any graduate uh, students there. So I had really no idea about uh, what a PhD would be like, what that entails, uh, that career trajectory. We did have research. It was all um, very much undergraduates and a PI. And that's sort of how I got my foot into the research world, um, doing primate trials. Um, and I, I did it just because I thought, well, that is so cool. Uh, I would love to be involved in primate research. I just thought it was an interesting, just fascinating thing to do. It was not in my plans at all. And I had to say it, uh, it definitely threw a, a wrench into things because up to that point, I was very much focused on going to medical school. I had all my ducks in a row as far as the, the prerequisites, the MCAT, et cetera. And then I sort of, you know, fell in love with the process of research, realized I didn't know that much about that world. So a lot of my time was sort of spent, um, as we just heard, kind of exploring the scientific spectrum. And it's it's hard to know, especially if you're coming from either a small liberal arts, a community college, um, a historically Black university. It can be very hard to get that exposure um, and sort of find your footing as to where you fit best along that spectrum, whether it is uh, bench work or clinical trial work. And I, I took a lot of time sort of deciding, you know, do I want to pursue just a career in clinical trials? Because to me, in my mind, logically, that seemed like a good way to bridge my interest in medicine and also my new passion for research. Um, but in the end, I decided, you know, I really wanted to to pursue something more translational and more more at the bench as well as, you know, a full medical degree. That's great. So I next want to ask Haley. So could you, you did um, the NIH post back, you know, prep program. Could you maybe give us like an overview of what the prep program is and what makes it like distinct in terms of a non prep program post back like research experience? Yeah, definitely. Um, although I, so I did the post back. I, is the, I think that they also have a prep that's like a summer program. Um, but I did the post back program. Okay. So, but yeah, I can tell you what that entails. Um, basically, you fill out the application and it will go into a database. And all of the PIs at the NIH have, who are looking to take on a student can look at your resume and offer you an interview. Um, but they also encourage you to reach out to PIs you're interested in. So um, just sending emails to like 10, 20, 30 PIs that you're kind of interested in and asking if they're taking on any summer students. Um, and then you interview and you get offered a spot. And then um, you typically the post back program, I, I would say on average, it's two years. Doing one year program is kind of rare. Um, I know people who have done um three, sometimes even four years at the post back program. Um, I actually only did one. That was something that I was like very firmly looking for. I just wanted one year so that I could, you know, go on with medical school. I was, um, it was kind of my plan to apply during my gap year because I, I didn't want to deal with the hassle of trying to apply for med medical school my senior year of college. Um, so it was always my plan to do a gap year and apply then. 
Um, so I just wanted to do one gap year and go on to medical school. And, and that worked out well for me, but most people do two or three years because um, it's really hard to get a, a really quality research project done in one year. And um, I had a, a very good experience there, but my project wasn't um, super exciting is, you know, a lot of mouse work and like just kind of following up on another project that was already going on and, and keeping things going. Um, but it is still a great opportunity and, and they have a lot of additional resources. Um, it's, it's for people who are planning to apply to an MD or a PhD program. So they have a lot of resources for uh, students, like how to interview, um, practice interviews, things like that. And also like community service opportunities and um, leadership opportunities uh, in within the program. That's great. So it sounds like the NIH like post back program is, uh, you know, kind of more structured and you're kind of around a lot of, uh, you know, folks who are in the similar kind of pathway as you. So that kind of community can kind of help uh, you all kind of achieve your, you know, next step goal um, for someone who didn't do the NIH post back program. So Anna, Remind me, you um, did a post back, you know, post back years doing research at Rockefeller, uh, you know, a non NIH program. Can you kind of explain how you found that opportunity or advice for folks who are kind of pursuing, like, who are not going to do the NIH post back program? Yeah. So I think if you're, if, if, if what you want to do during that time after you graduate is, like research, sort of bench research in a laboratory. I mean, I think generally just thinking about like what are major research institutions near near you or in the geographic region that you want to be. Um, you know, for me, I wasn't specifically planning to go to New York City, but because it was geographically close to my undergraduate institution, they had like people from, from Rockefeller came to our campus um, and, so it was a little bit of a similar process in that they like got my CV and then they sort of, in, in at Rockefeller, they'll circulate it among, um, you know, the labs there. But I think, I, you know, other people who've sort of taken similar approaches where if you have a particular area of research interest, um, you know, looking at the institutions nearby and trying to identify laboratories that, you know, are actively doing research in that area and, and emailing people and you know, that was something that then once I was in my lab, we were, I was involved with the process of hiring sort of my replacement. Um, and, you know, we just had put up a job posting um, and then collected applications. And, you know, I think being really, um, if it is something that you see, I, I think if you could make the case that like there is a fit here, either in terms of either previous experience or in terms of like a genuine interest that you have, I think that goes a long way. Um, for people who are looking to hire, you know, a research assistant or a laboratory technician, um, and just being persistent, um, you know, and then and trying a bunch of people um, would, would be my advice. But again, that's if you're specifically looking for getting sort of bench research experience during that time. That's great. Um, so the next question, maybe I'll ask uh, back to Brian, um, you know, what can I, so the question is, what can I do during my gap year to be like a competitive applicant, like specifically a competitive applicant to the MD PhD programs? Like you switched from, you know, applying MD. How did your application change after your post back years? How did you use those years um, to make yourself competitive for kind of a dual degree program? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, I think immersing yourself in the in whatever experience you choose. Um, granted, I chose to do three years of research. Um, really immersed myself, took leadership roles um, while I was there. Um, leadership roles, you know, in my job, mentorship roles, being able to train people who are coming into the lab, um, and then probably most importantly is, you know, I said take a, um, you know, immerse yourself, but you want to have a meaningful research experience. You want to have a research experience that you could go into interviews and you could talk all day about it. You could talk all day, all night about it and you can kind of control the conversation. Um, and so, so you know your research in and out. And I think those meaningful experiences, um, talking about your research and talking about your mentorship um, while you're interviewing really, really hits home with some of those, some of those interviewees. Um, but I think that's probably, probably the biggest thing. Um, 
while you're out doing research is, is to immerse yourself and, and really um, have an experience that you could talk about. That's great. Yeah, it definitely seems like research is usually the focus of folks uh, post back years. Uh, and, and that seems to be kind of what dual degree programs are looking for in students is a real passion for research. Uh, but it is nice to also have the time during your post back years to work on the MCAT or um, get more clinical training hours. So um, next question I want to uh, ask Deborah, um, since I believe you did a master's degree during your uh, post back year. So the, the question is, you know, what are the pros and cons of doing a master's or a specialized master's program versus like doing, you know, working as a, as a work doing research as your kind of job as an RA or a tech? Um, did you, uh, did that come up for you when you were applying and how did the master's degree help you? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I think that um, where I would like to start with that is that um, I had already completed all of my pre-med requirements. So for me, a post back didn't really make sense. A lot of times people sort of go that route because they need to fill in certain requirements um, to meet all the pre-med checklists. Um, and I really wanted to study something that I hadn't studied before, and that's what made the program so attractive. I think also um, what Anna had touched on is that it can be really, really challenging if you're moving to you know, a new city or if you have no connections to where you're going to undergrad, which was the case for me. I had moved there for school, but I wasn't from there. Um, it would, can be really hard to get your, your foot in the door with a big uh, institution. Of course, send letters of interest. There's certainly no harm, um, but it, it is a ton of work to sort of do your homework, investigate every every lab at that institution, have a background that would fit with their current projects, etc. Um, and it can be sort of low throughput unless you have some sort of bridge and connection. And oftentimes the master's program sort of acts as a way to study something that you certainly will not be studying in medical school. I chose to study uh, the relationship between neuroscience and nutrition, which I got in, interested in actually because of a biochem professor in my senior year who said, you know, this program at Columbia is really great. It's a lot of biochemistry. I know you might be interested in it. Do you want to give it a go? Um, so that's sort of how I moved, packed up my whole life and moved out to New York. Um, but I do think that had I not done that, there's certainly no way I would have ended up doing research at, at, at an Ivy League for five years. There's just, you know, not a chance um, in that direction. I think that also, in addition to studying something that you wouldn't study otherwise, because we certainly don't study nutrition in medical school at all, um, it, it gives you a chance to sort of see all of the, the research possibilities at a different level. Like if you're going to a small liberal arts school or a community college, the research that's done at those institutions certainly is at a different level than, than is being done at the big universities that are sort of more postdoc and graduate school driven. Great, thank, thank you. Um, so the next question, I'm actually just gonna uh, pose it to anyone who wants to, to answer, uh, but the, it is during a gap year, are other part-time jobs, not in healthcare and not in research, like just for the purposes of income to live, are those like disfavored in applicants? Uh, maybe if any of you have experience or know folks who've, who've uh, had those jobs during their post back years, or maybe you sit on your uh, school admissions committees and you have any insight? I can answer that. Sorry, I don't want to talk the whole time. But um, so as most people probably know, most master's degrees aren't free. So choosing to do that was definitely a financial consideration on my end. And one thing I did to offset that cost was take uh, sort of part time gigs here and there. I bartended a lot. Um, and I have to say that I think that that shows a level of like grit and scrappiness when you go to apply to med school that that admissions committees aren't necessarily used to seeing. And people do love to talk about that in the interviews. So I I wouldn't count yourself out just because, you know, you have to babysit twins on the side, which is a very hard job, by the way. Yeah, no, that's great. I'm I'm glad you that we have someone on who has experience uh doing that. Did you have any uh like questions about it when you were interviewing um at MD PhD programs? 
Oh, absolutely. Uh, and I do have a lot of wild stories about also uh, like signing up to be a research participant. Like they'll pay you a couple hundred dollars to be um, a healthy subject, a healthy control. Uh, yeah, all sorts of all sorts of good stories to come up during your interviews. And uh, I absolutely would put that on uh, your application. Like do not be embarrassed about quote unquote blue collar work that you're doing on the side to um, to offset your financial costs. That's great advice. Um, may I'll come back to Alan now. So uh, I have a question is, you know, how do you decide on like how many gap years you're going to take? I mean, um, you know, some people take one, some people take five and like, you know, can you walk us through like your decision on when you decided, okay, I'm going to go ahead and apply this cycle? Yeah, definitely. So I'm going to reflect on a couple of things that uh, have been said previously. So I also did the same post back program, I think the same program that Haley described, I was at the NIH. Um, originally, it was just going to be one year. Um, and I was I joined a lab that was very understanding of that. And they, they also benefited from that kind of flexibility, but then going into um, deciding whether or not I would apply or stay a second year, you know, I kind of just took a look around and, and assessed my situation. I was being productive during those time, uh, during that time. And I think, you know, you can take any number of gap years for any number of reasons, but I think at the end of the day, interviewers just want to see that you were being productive. And it does, that doesn't have to mean academically or scientifically productive, but just productive. And, and everyone loves a good story. Even if you were traveling, I mean, you can find a way to weave that into how you became the person you are today that's going into medical school. Um, and so for me, I mean, it was, like I said, I only went into it expecting one year, but I was in a good, in a good lab situation. I made some great friends in the DC area and I was more than happy to stay longer to keep doing the work I was doing. I was in no rush to get back to, to my training. And I think that's important because these delivery programs are eight year programs. And then if you continue to pursue medicine, you have residency and fellowship after that. I mean, it's a long time and I don't think anyone should really rush you as an individual and tell you how many gap years to take. Like I said, just be productive and and see what your situation is and what makes the most sense for you um keeping in mind what what your current what your current situation is and what your goals are what timeline you may have for yourself um going forward great um i just want to you know pull the crowd how many of you had publications that were already out in print when you applied to dual degree programs by show of hands Okay, great. So two, three, three of you. Okay. So then for folks who did not have any publication, because that's what this uh, submitted question is, and I'll summarize is, you know, should someone continue their gap years or take additional years if they don't yet have any publications, but maybe they're working on one? Like uh, maybe Haley, maybe you can tell us like, you know, you didn't have any publications when you applied, but you had a really enriching post back experience. Can you maybe demystify if publications are a necessity? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I don't think, um, well, again, I applied MD only originally. So for the MD only track, certainly you don't need a publication. Um, for the MD PhD, I mean, I've been reviewing applications for our school this past couple months and every applicant I have reviewed has, you know, some type of publication, maybe not necessarily a first author, but they might have like a second author or if they're not the first author, they have several publications under that, you know, that they're listed as an author on. Um, and I will say that one of the big reasons I kind of decided to switch from MD to MD PhD was because I, I want, I did want to be a scientist. I was trying to be a physician scientist on a non-traditional route and avoid having to get my PhD. But, um, it's very difficult to get into a physician scientist training program if you don't have a first author. So I wanted to, I decided to just go ahead and get my PhD, it's kind of solidify that route, really like increase my chances of being able to get into a physician scientist training program. Um, so I think there's kind of some ways you can try to get around it, like trying to be a, like, kind of like I did like you can go along the pathway without having 
the first first author but at some point like it's going to become necessary I think if you want to be well if you want to be a physician scientist certainly you're gonna have to get one at some point but um I think there's some ways to get around it if you want to go straight to MD PhD you eh, not necessarily first author but you need some publications I think and okay great and then when you're saying physician scientist training program just for folks who aren't familiar that's like that's after medical school that's like a research focused residency and to get into those programs um they, they usually attract a lot of md phd student yeah. md you know medical students because they have you know these first off of the author publications but um you know for the applications you're you know reviewing for your own md phd institution like does it matter if um someone is on uh like posters versus um, preprints, like, do you factor those into um, a, a publication? Uh, I would say I don't see, in the applications I've reviewed, I haven't really seen people listing many posters. It's a, more of a focus on, like, actual publications. But preprints certainly, I think, are, like, fine because, um, you know, even just publishing can take months and months so I, if that's not like a negative if it hasn't been fully um accepted yet that's great gonna, yeah brian can i yeah can i just say can i follow up on this if so if you're like i said if, as long as you're able to really talk about your research and talk about it well in an interview i think that's really much more impactful um if you're at a point where you're kind of teeter-tottering oh i'm in the middle of writing a paper or i have a paper written up bring that paper with you to interview you know, whether you're uh, whether you're first author, you know, the your your interviewees are going to love to see that you brought that with you um, and you may stand out in that, in that manner. Um, and so you may be able to share that um, that paper. That's something that I did with with one with one of my papers. And so um, I think that, you know, finding ways around not having a publication is certainly doable. And when you do write that MD, PhD essay, share that you did a poster presentation, share that, you know, you know, you practice your communication skills of, of, of talking about your research. And so um, I think all of those things, you know, if you don't have a publication are a way around it. Um, I don't think it's worth committing a whole extra year if, if you're ready to go to the next step of your life. Um, now, if, you know, if you have some leeway and you really enjoy the science, um, by all means stay. And that's something that I did, you know, by all means stay. Um, so don't let it hold you back because there are ways around it. Um, but, you know, really consider where you're at in life. And if, if you want to stay a little extra longer and potentially get your name on a few more publications, it's, it's, it's bound to help. Yeah, I'll just second some of what Brian said. I think, um, you know, I didn't have any publications when I applied. We didn't have any like under review. Um, and I, I want to recognize that some of some of this is going to be potentially out of your control. Like for me, I joined a lab that was very, New, like I, I joined my PI like while he was on the faculty job market, coming out of like his postdoc and in an independent research position, and so we were like building a lab from scratch, and so I spent three years with him, and we did a lot of really interesting research and collaborated with, um, you know, a bunch of more well-established labs, and it was great for me because I got exposure to a lot of different types of scientific questions, and those were all things you know, each of those projects and collaborations that we worked on were things that I talked about in my essays and in my interviews, um, you know, and I did have um, like two poster presentations about the work that I was doing. And that was also a core piece of what I was able to talk about the substance of that work. Um, and I think also my letters of recommendation really spoke to, um, you know, my, my skills and research and and helped contextualize, I think, I'm sure too, like sort of where the lab was at. And many of these were like very early stage projects. And so it just wasn't reasonable that like even in three years, we would we would really pull something through to completion and get it published in that time period. Um, so, you know, it, it's not just about you and how hard you work. And so I think just kind of working within whatever framework you find yourself um, and communicating that to other people um, and communicating what it is you're excited about and communicating like what meaningful contributions you made to the work that you were involved with, I think is really key. And then working with your recommend your, your letter writers as well to make sure that they're also communicating some of those things in their letters. That's great. 
Uh, yeah, real quick. I, I could not agree more with uh, what everything Anna just said. Um, at least with my program, I mean, if you have if you have publications, list them. If you have posters, even then, I think that's a good a good way to show that you have experience communicating science, even if you don't have the publication to show for it. Um, at least my program is very aware that the number of publications you have, especially as um, not the project lead, it's it is truly luck of the draw. You might end up in a lab that can pump out you know a paper every couple months. Um, and as an undergrad, maybe you're lucky enough to have a first authorship or you're stuck doing a project that just requires a lot of troubleshooting, but that doesn't make your experiences any less valuable. Um, so kind of like Anna said, I think if you've been in a lab for two, three, four years and you don't have any papers to show for it, that's still enough time that you're probably going to want a letter from that person. And that's that person should be able to if you don't want to talk about any of the hardships you face because you're worried that's going to come across a certain way, your PI should be more than happy to talk about like, oh, during this time, insert person worked relentlessly on troubleshooting and they demonstrated a lot of um, mental fortitude and all that stuff. Like they they can talk about those things and it, you shouldn't, um, kind of like Brian was saying, you shouldn't hold yourself back from applying because you don't have publications. Um, I mean, these are very, very selective programs. And so they're going to be very comprehensive in, in seeing what your experiences are and, and something like not having a paper, but having three years of experience. I mean, they'll, they'll look into like what exactly was going on. They'll want to know. Yeah. Also just, good point. Sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to mention quickly that there's all often a trade-off between um like filling in other holes in your application that are not research like if you really need to get more patient exposure you might need to take a job that is scribing in the hospital or working as a translator and that's not going to give you research publications um that doesn't mean it's less important for example the work that i did doing uh clinical trials those were nationwide sponsor driven biotech trials they were not pi driven meaning that there were no publications coming from those we were like testing drugs and devices and seeing like they they did publish papers but not in the same traditional academic way but it was a lot of patient exposure and project management and it was more like a professional job so i'm just saying I know we're focusing a lot on research during gap years, but there's other things to do during your gap years that will show productivity and that admissions committees will respond to and understand. Yeah, that's really great advice. I think from the admissions committee perspective, like the, I think that they would look really fondly on a student who um, sees and identifies their gaps or weaknesses and then, um, you know, goes after those to kind of make uh, their application as holistic as possible. So really good advice. Um, this next question I hear um, quite often is, is, you know, when you apply to these MD or DO PhD programs, like you often will apply with some sort of narrative behind your personal like research interest. Do, did any of you like do research during your undergrad or during your post back years that are completely like unrelated to what you're currently doing your research on now or were that was unrelated to the research narrative that you crafted when you applied to dual degree program, like do folks need to do post back research in the field that they're most passionate about? Um, maybe anyone who wants to chime in. Yeah, I can say something. I mean, I, mine has been in a very similar fashion. I started with oncology research and then went into hematology oncology and I've stayed in that and that's what I want to do but definitely I, I don't think that's necessary at all I think it's perfectly fine to switch around and try different things um you don't want to get stuck doing something that you don't like you know so it's perfectly fine to branch out and try different things yeah, a lot of times when you apply to these post back programs, you don't have, or, you know, I, for me, I applied to, to jobs. I applied for research assistant jobs. You don't get the choice. Uh, you know, they tell you briefly what they do, you know, but you don't get the choice on which project you're going to be on as a research tech. And so um, it, it may not be what, what you love. And uh, I think that's a good thing is getting exposed to multiple things. You definitely shouldn't um, study one thing your entire life because as you start to study different fields and see different fields, you're able to pull from those fields and bring them into you know, what you ultimately want to do. And even those of us who are doing our PhD, I will say, 
um, we're not, probably not going to be doing the same thing, you know, as as physician scientists in the future. Um, it's really getting that training of, of how to do research, how to fail, um, how to how to deal with that adversity. That's what you're looking for. Um, you're looking for those experiences and you're looking how to think like a scientist and start to think like a scientist. Um, and so you can apply it to different fields that you're interested in as as your life goes on um, and as your career progresses. So here at Michigan State, and so so my DO PhD program is is different from a lot of dual year programs in that we had to get accepted into the medical school and the grad school and then get accepted into the dual year program. I know a lot of programs do one straight shot interview. Um, but that being said, from a grad school application perspective, I know that I was offered an interview just on, you know, why do you want to do research and not necessarily what kind of research do you want to do? And then my program, as as I think most programs do, they give you the opportunity to do rotations. And then it's all just about letting those labs um, and they, they could be in something completely different, but seeing if being able to sell yourself to them that you uh, are worth giving one of limited spots in a rotation for um probably didn't say that super eloquently but i i contrast that with some programs i hear about where you don't get to rotate or um you have very limited rotations or very short rotations where you don't get a chance to get a feel for the lab and i think um that's just something for people to keep in mind and i know the the question was just does your research have to relate and and my short answer to that is no um but then when you're doing your rotations I think that's a good time for you to explore what what kind of fields haven't you gone into that you may actually be interested in. And um, again, if your program doesn't let you do rotations, I'm not saying don't look, don't look into that program, don't consider that program, but it does just make that decision a lot more um, high stakes. So exercise due diligence when you're choosing a lab like that. That's great. Yeah, and maybe I'll just chime in with my own kind of advice that's along these lines is my, I went to, uh, like Deborah, I went to a small liberal arts college and we didn't even have any neuroscience uh, courses. And and my mentor was like, well, you know, taking your gap years, like you're planning on doing is, is kind of a perfect opportunity to try something new um, with basically no risk and and, and learn a new field. And um, I, yeah, chose to do uh, research in a, in a neuroscience lab and it was a great decision. So um, you can kind of think of your gap years as a also an opportunity to intellectual opportunity for uh, trying something new out and trying a new field out. Um, I have a question here. So um, I, this isn't particularly related to gap years, but maybe it could be for someone who does like a, the post back programs that allow you to take like more courses and, and give you grades, but you know, uh, can anyone give us insight in whether it says whether can, I can still get into an MD PhD with my GPA? They don't list, list their GPA, but um, you know how important is the GPA, and does that ever factor into someone's I you know reasoning to do a gap year where they take maybe courses uh, or retake courses? I can touch on that because um, I think that's a big motivator for some folks when they go and pursue a master's degree. Um, full disclosure, I, I graduated with a 3.7 for my small liberal arts. And then when I went to Columbia, I had a 4.1 for my master's. And I think that the point is that it can be a double-edged sword. Um, anytime that you're taking classes, especially if you're going to go to um, a bigger institution that might be, you know, con historically conceived as more rigorous or a different style of learning than your your background is from so I think it can go either way like you want to be careful um, you don't want to spread yourself too thin especially if you're going to work and do your degree at the same time that's so critical because you're going to be really tired I was very very tired um, you don't want to like go and sort of like have have your GPA drop that's not like the best look in the world so um yeah, I, it's a double-edged sword in that way, but I think that it certainly can strengthen an application if you are concerned about that. That's great. I will, I will just, yeah. I could add that the GPA, GPA does matter. Um, in some schools, it matters much more than others. Um, so something, something to look out to, but that's not to say you can't make up in other areas, right? You have strengths in other areas that make up for it. It's, it's kind of this, uh, balance beam in a way or, or teeter-totter in a way and so 
um, if you are lacking in your in your GPA, certainly you can go like take the take the chance at the double edged sword um, and try to increase it. But also there's there's plenty of other things you could do to strengthen your application in other areas. Um, but they do weigh GPA and MCAT quite heavily um, these days. Yeah, I would I would recommend. I think maybe someone can help me with an a the name. I think it's like the MSAR. It's like a program through uh, MCAS where you can get all the schools, their average GPA and their average um, MCAT scores. Um, because it, for there that like the GPA will definitely matter. Like after a certain cutoff, schools will like not really consider you. Like there's there's like a range of like depending on the schools, but for certain schools, like they will not consider you below a certain GPA. Um, so I would really recommend that resource to kind of see like what schools you would be a good applicant for if those are schools you're interested in and then use that to kind of decide if you need to do some extra classes to boost your GPA. And I'll also say at least when I, when I do the student interviews for my school, the Ohio State University, we try to be very holistic in our approach. And our when we do the student interviews, we don't see any grades at all. Um, we're really focused on like, would we like to have you as a classmate? Um, so again, trying to find a school that's a little more holistic and might be a little more, if you have like some certain exception, something that happened during undergrad that affected your grades, you might want to try to look for a school that's going to be a little bit more understanding of that and take that into account when they're interviewing you. Hey, I'll second what Haley said about using, I also forget exactly the acronym, but that does have a lot of helpful information sort of to gauge. Um, you know, where you might be a good fit as an applicant and um, just to learn more, to have some data to inform kind of your assessment of where you're at. Um, and then logistically, I just wanted to add that if, if you are in a position either for GPA reasons or in terms of fulfilling prerequisites where you do want to be taking classes um, before applying, there are a number of different ways you can do that, right? Like you can do that through a formal master's program there are like official postdoc programs for career changers for people who like weren't pre-med at all and need to take like all of the prerequisite courses. And there are like one year and two year versions of that. Um, for me, I had some of the prerequisites, like I'd taken, you know, my like calculus and, um, you know, some of the other, you know, writing courses and things like that. Um, so it wasn't enough that it made sense for me to do. And also given that I didn't know I wanted to do medicine, it didn't make sense to dedicate, you know, a whole year or two just to doing all of those prerequisites. Um, but what I ended up doing was I, I, you know, I sort of, I was in a big city and so there were a number of different institutions. I was fortunate to kind of have options. And so I, you know, I tried to look for a public university that would have lower tuition costs. Um, so that I could be paying for for my tuition out of my income. Um, and additionally, some of the programs too, like for me, because I was employed by these academic institutions, as an employee, sometimes they'll have tuition benefits. Um, and so I was able to get, I think for at least three semesters, like uh, like a half to all of my tuition, I think like maybe like $2,000 worth of tuition a year or something like that um, reimbursed to me through my employer. Um, so that was really big. And then I took like basically one class a semester. Um, so sort of to, to Deborah's point about not overwhelming yourself, I was able to sort of spread it out. And then I wanted to get sort of more longitudinal research experience. And so I was able to sort of do those things in parallel in a way that was still manageable for me. Um, so I think really, you know, there's a lot of different ways of, of doing that. And, you know, I started out as a non-degree seeking student. And then I realized that if I like applied as a degree seeking second bachelor's degree student, I would also get cheaper tuition. So then I did that and I was in my second bachelor's degree in chemistry this time. And um, so, so just, you know, you can be creative and, and just talk to people and there's a whole lot of different things that people have done and ways that you can make this work. That's Something great. I want to add yeah, go ahead. Is just that um, I, I agree with everything everyone just said. Um, and you, going back to the whole, your grades shouldn't define you to, they matter to an, to some extent, but, um, there's going to be a lot of programs that will 
you know, see everything else about your application. But one thing I just want to mention that I think is important to mention is even though I fully um, subscribe to the notion that you can have, you know, someone who's book smart versus someone who's street smart and you can have someone who, you know, you want them to be your doctor, but maybe they don't do the best on exams, but they're great people, people, right? Um, unfortunately for, for med school, you know, standardized exams are very par for the course and you're going to be taking them during med school and you're going to have your step exams. Um, so if you didn't do too well, um, in your undergrad courses, your GPA isn't too strong and, but it, being a physician is what you want to do. Absolutely go for it and, um, do, do what you need to do to, to get yourself into whichever program best suits you. But, um, you know, like go, the exams aren't going anywhere. So I think it'd be important to to also look into what what can you do going forward to make sure that future exams you take aren't reflective of your aren't reflective of who you are and and your capabilities as a future physician or physician scientist. That's great. Awesome. Well, I do want to be respectful of people's time. We're coming up on the hour. Uh, so maybe we can round it out there. Um, so First off, thank you all to the panelists for, for joining us today, sharing your advice. Um, for anyone who wants to you know, know more about our panelists or maybe get in touch with any of them, their information is posted on a Google Doc that Min posted in the chat at the beginning. Um, so I encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, I also want to thank the other APSA committees that helped put on this session. So um, the PR committee for helping spread the advertisements and Kyle for uh, live tweeting this session, the tech committee for hosting the registration page. Um, it couldn't happen with all uh, the work from all those folks. Um, I'm going to post the link to our interactive series uh, website, and there you'll be able to see kind of recordings from our past sessions. And then that's where we'll post um, the upcoming registration links for the rest of the uh, webinars we're hosting throughout the rest of the academic year. So with that, Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to the participants for uh, making this session interactive and asking great questions. Um, and we'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks all.